Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vaga Maradian up on Capitol Hill at the conclusion of a great panel discussion on fifth generation combat aircraft capabilities that were sponsored by the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies. And we have with us, coincidentally, the Dean of the Mitchell Institute, retired Air Force Lieutenant General Dave Deptula, uh, who apparently was related to one of the other panel members. Uh, yeah. Dave, thanks very much uh, for joining us. And, and you should be really, really proud. Your, your son, uh, uh, we did a, an interview with him, and I think this is the first ever father son. Uh, on the Defense and Aerospace Report, yeah, so we're I'm honored. Just a, I'm just a little bit proud of him. He's a, <laughs> he's a great pilot. Uh, and, uh, and, and flew 15s, and I think flew the same airplane you'd flown once upon a time, didn't he, once? Yes, absolutely. Uh, actually, I went out in 2008 to uh, 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 Kadena Air Base, Okinawa, and we actually flew against each other in a basic fighter maneuvering uh, uh, engagement. But we were flying the exact same tail numbers that I had flown 29 years before. The only difference was when I flew them, they only had about 20 hours on them. When he was flying them, uh, they had about 7,000 hours on them, uh, which gets to the whole point of why we need to recapitalize our force. Um, I, absolutely, and and I and I want to get to that. But one of the, the the things that was making headlines last week was China debuted at the Zhuhai Air Show, the J20. Uh, not really debuted. I mean, the airplane has sure. been uh, sort of popping up here and there. The J31 is another aircraft, stealth aircraft, uh, uh, much more along the lines of an F-35 that that is under development. The Russians, obviously, with the 50, have been working on um, stealthy aircraft uh, as well. As you looked at the debut of the 20, what were some of your conclusions, and what do you think people are getting? wrong about how that airplane is going to be used. For example, some people are saying, you know, it's the F-22 clone, but it's a very different aircraft, isn't it? Right. It is, um, Vago. First, both the fact that the Russians and the Chinese are pursuing low observable aircraft um, with the kind of capabilities um, that the J-20 have uh, and the uh, PAC-FA, uh, if you will, in terms of payload and range, is their realization that they cannot allow the United States to gain superiority in the aerospace environment. So these aircraft are designed to challenge our ability to do that. Um, the J-20 in particular is different than the F-22 in the context that if, if you take a look and analyze the design, uh, may have some significant low observable capabilities on the front end, but not all aspect, nor is it built as a dogfighter. Uh, it's built to go a long way or to maintain presence for a long period of time. But quite frankly, the biggest concern is it's designed to carry long-range weapons uh, that can be targeted against some of our uh, single nodal point of uh, uh, high-value assets, if you will. Things like RC-135s, E3s. Tankers, uh, you bet. Um, uh, those kinds of, uh, of aircraft. Uh, and it's also significant that they are moving into uh, an era where they're now designing aircraft, not just as evolution of, of previous designs that they've had, but they're moving into new space. They realize they have to do that, um, or uh, our aerospace capabilities will uh, render their ability to operate uh, ineffective. You've been um, a very long-time advocate of fifth generation, going back all the way to uh, the Gulf War, where you were a key planner of it, obviously. Uh, but throughout your con career, have been a very, very uh, a prominent and vocal advocate of it. What was the point and the importance of today's panel discussion on fifth generation capabilities? Well, I think um, all of the, the panelists, um, by the way, the, one of the biggest takeaways that struck me from the five gentlemen that were up here um, was not just their description of the capabilities of the aircraft, but the awesome perspectives uh, and interpretation of how those capabilities can be used and integrated. Uh, and that's where I think the value of fifth gen lies. Uh, Chip Burt, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, U.S. Marine Corps, made the point that I've been trying to make for 20 years, that the F-22 and F-35 are not fighters. Um, they're F-B-E-A-R-C-E-W-A-W-C-S 22s and 35s. They're flying sensor shooters that have the ability to act as information nodes in a combat cloud universe, if you will, made up of... Uh, platforms, not just airborne, but also operating at sea and on, li on land that can be networked together. That's what 6th Gen is. 6th Gen is building 
a capable, reliable, uh, and redundant, robust combat cloud where we can achieve ubiquitous and seamless sharing of information amongst all the aircraft and ships and land vehicles that are operating in a particular area of responsibility. Once we achieve that, and we can get to order of magnitude increases in aerodynamics, propulsion, low observability, should we only consider building a new platform. But right now, for the foreseeable future, 6th Gen is ubiquitous and seamless sharing of information throughout the battle space. Um, and, and a shout out to the other folks, Lieutenant uh, Colonel Cap Gunn, uh, who, who was uh, at Headquarters Air Force. Uh, and a Mitchell Institute fellow, I might add. And, and a Mitchell Institute uh, fellow. Didn't seem to have hurt his career at all. Uh, and obviously you have Chip Burke, uh, you had uh, Ghost uh, Deptula uh, as well, and then, uh, and then Punk Stoli. Who was uh, also a Mitchell Institute fellow. Who was also a Mitchell Institute fellow, yes. And I, and I think we're going to be seeing, mm -hmm. uh, be seeing more, of, uh, more, more of a Magdalene. We, right. we did talk to him a little bit about the mentality change needed to transition from a fourth generation aircraft to, to the 22, obviously, because he was the chief weapons instructor there at, at Nellis. Um, this is a time, though, when the Navy and the Air Force have been investing a lot of intellectual energy on what is that sixth generation capability going to look like. Um, you've already said what the prerequisites are before we, right. we, we get there. But as people are visualizing it. A, how much in, how much commonality should there be between what the Navy is doing and the Air Force is doing? And I also want to ask you about the kind of weapons that we're going to need uh, for the future as well. Well, those are both excellent questions. First, in terms of commonality, um, it's less important what the particular operating systems are than the ability that we achieve connectivity amongst the tactical level systems so that uh, regardless of whether a uh, set of systems are being provided by the naval component or the air component of a joint task force, um, they can seamlessly share information. Um, that's the first, uh, uh, first answer to your question. The second question on weapons um, is, you know, we have fifth generation aircraft today, but we're still operating them with third generation weapons. We do need to up our game in terms of the kinds of weapons that we build, particularly in the context of their ability to share information, be able to be uh, controlled by a variety of different systems and increase their range as well. Range obviously is a place where uh, we're basically being uh, outsticked by weapons, air-to-air -air weapons that the, uh, that the Chinese are, are building. Uh, and uh, there are efforts ongoing, uh, but we need to, I think, accelerate those in the U.S. to, to match the weapons with the capabilities of the platforms that we have. Something closer, for example, to what the Navy had with the Phoenix and the and the Tomcat system that had an well, ability to go 100 miles. About, yeah, I want to be careful about. Um, I'll use the analogy in terms of that range, um, but you know the, we've moved beyond what the the Phoenix and the Tomcat can. Sir, thanks very very much for joining us. Hey, it's great to be here. Thanks, Fargo.